Boker Tov Givrin. Ma Shalom Kim. All right, good. You're all doing well. Today we want to do a number of things, and uh, one of them is to finish up some of the translation we're doing in Ruth. And then also, I want to uh, take the time for us to uh, talk a little bit more about diagramming in preparation for your diagramming assignment uh, that we want to have you turn in on Thursday. I trust that all of you received the email that I sent out telling you it wasn't due today in spite of what this schedule says. And so we want to continue on here to pick up a bit more on the translation first of all. So let's go. We left off on Ruth chapter 1, verse 8. That brings us to verse 9. And we left off with James Wood. Uh, Scott, do you feel ready to do translation? I know that you've been out and I'm not requiring you to do it this morning. I haven't looked at it. I'm All right, okay. let's, let's skip over you this morning then, okay? Uh, Roger, if you will take please uh, verse 9 and read t uh, through to the Athnac and then translate. <clears throat> Um Senna Um Senna Menucha Menucha All right <clears throat> The Lord brought uh, Keep going, you haven't reached the half yet Oh, okay uh, Isha Bae 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 Shah. All right. Um, the Lord um, gave to them um, they may you may find rest one Oh. Okay, now notice this is uh, still Naomi speaking in the context, so she is speaking, may Yahweh give to you, and remember here the second masculine plural pronominal suffix, chem, is being used because of the preceding verse where we also had the uh, third mas or second masculine plural being used of the two daughters-in-law. And um, may you find rest each, Isha, literally woman, each in the house of her husband. Each in the house of her husband. Uh, notice the mapik in the he on the second Isha. That is a third feminine singular pronominal suffix on ish, making it her husband. Now notice that uh, these two are now widows, and so basically Naomi is uh, wishing that they might marry again, that they might remarry, and that they might find rest, each in the house of her husband. Uh, it says something about the practice of the day, that these young ladies, being widowed early as young uh, ladies, were expected to remarry. Naomi's expectation that they would remarry even though Naomi herself doesn't remarry, but remember she's an aged widow. Uh, she had grown adult sons who had married these two, so she's not expecting to remarry, but she is expecting these young ladies to remarry, and of course it goes on to have Ruth remarry uh, to Boaz. And we're not told what happened to Orpah. But this is the expectation that Naomi had from the very start. Yes, Gus? When you look up the word ish and the word isha in the lexicon, you find that it can ish, ish means man and isha means woman, but they both can mean each. It's the way you say each in Hebrew. Uh, remember the idiom we had? They spoke to one another. They spoke to each other. Each to his brother, literally. A man to his brother. Okay? 
All right. Then let's go to the uh, second half of verse 9. Or the qu question first, Dennis. I mean, uh, James, excuse me. So you wouldn't translate that each woman, it would just be each. Each, right. I just say each. If you have each woman, that's not terribly wrong, but it just is smoother to say each. Okay, Dennis, the second half, please. Like to shut in the hand, the hand. Why? To shina, the one. Why? To can, to can. Okay, wow, Tiv Kenna. Okay, and translate. And she kissed him. So she kissed him. And they called. And they wept. All right. Uh, so she kissed them. Notice what. Tishak has only two root letters showing. It is a wayik tol, obviously. So the tau is an imperfect prefix. To have no suffix means it has to be either second masculine singular or third feminine singular by context. Since Naomi is the one who is talking and acting, it's third feminine singular. You have a doubling doggish in the sheen which indicates something has been assimilated, most likely a noon. Therefore, it is from the root nashak, which means kiss. Nashak, the noon has been assimilated. So she kissed them. Notice la hen has changed now to the third feminine plural where we had the second masculine plural on la kem in the first part of the verse. Then or so, they, tisenna, is a, third, is a third feminine plural imperfect. Cal, imperfect, third feminine plural. So why you told from nasa. Notice again the doubling doggish here in the scene so that we know that the root is nasa, which means he lifted up, he lifted. So it's they lifted colon. It has a third feminine plural pronominal suffix on it. Colon. They lifted up their voice. They lifted up their voice. An idiom that means to cry loudly. Okay? They cried out loudly and wept. Tifkenna. Tifkenna from baka, the verb you had on the uh, exam from Genesis chapter 37, where you had Jacob weeping, and here they are weeping. It's from baith, kaf, and hay. Baith, kaf, and hay. Why is there a doggish in the kaf? Because the schwa under the preceding baith closes the preceding syllable after a closed syllable a bagad kafath letter takes the hardening doggish. It's just a hardening doggish. It is not a doubling doggish. The hirik under the prefix tells you it's an imperfect or nifal. We don't have a nifal triangle here, so it has to be a cal. It's a cal imperfect third feminine plural from baka. Baith, kaf, and he. He wept. There, they wept. Any questions here? Any questions on verse 9? All right, Jan, if you would please take the entirety of verse 10. It's a short one. <laughs> Make. Excellent reading. All right, translation. Then they said to her, Surely with you will return to your people. All right. Very well done, Jan. 
Okay, so they said to her, notice here we have again the cal imperfect, third feminine plural. The root is amer, aleph, mem, resh. The reason for the holum over the aleph is because it's a pay, a pay aleph verb, an initial aleph verb, one aleph, and it behaves un, uh, very unusually, and you have to get used to seeing that holum on amer in the imperfect. La. Notice the mapik in the hay that indicates this is a third feminine singular pronominal suffix on the lamed. Why is a doggish in the lamed? Obviously a doubling doggish. Uh, that is an interesting question. Usually the doubling doggish occurs when you have that particular form in pause and pronounced as part of the preceding word. And it's just one of the Masoretic uh, idiosyncrasies. Ki, he translated it as indeed or surely because it's emphatic here. There's nothing here that's an answer to give cause because um, it doesn't make any sense to translate it as because. Be, what is the cause of? There's nothing said. So it has to be indeed or surely. Itak, notice the hirik under the aleph. This is eth or eighth, but it is used as the preposition with. Notice the hirik. Because the with takes the hirik, I class vowel, whereas if it was an object, it would take the old, the O class vowel, the O class vowel. So this is with you, second feminine singular, nashuv. And here again, you can go to the chart either in your textbook or on page two of the uh, uh, exam number two that you took. And you can look up the forms as they occur with, with uh, only two root letters showing. And that, uh, that is back on page 174 of your textbook. And you find out that it has to be either a middle uh, vowel verb or it has to be a two doubled. And it's not from shavav, it is from shuv. You have the shurik there to tell you that. And so it's a noon is the prefix of the cal imperfect first common plural. We will re return with you. Indeed, we will return with you and make to your people. To your people. Questions on verse 10. Questions on verse 10. All right. Let's go to verse 10. 11 then, uh, George. Wa tomer na na ami shuvna benote benotai benotai lama te te lak kena te lak na te lak na. Okay, you can stop there at the ethnic. All right, and translate. So Naomi said, Return my daughters. What shall you go with me? Yeah, why? Why, why will you go with me? Why would you go with me? All right, as we look at this, we have Tomer, Wat Tomer, that's that Amer again with the Holum. It's a cal imperfect, third feminine singular, why you told from Amer, Aleph, Mem, Resh. Naomi is the name, proper name. Shovna, Shovna is an imperative, feminine plural. Cal imperative, feminine plural from Shuv. Benotai, Benot, here is Banot, daughters. And here with the first common singular pronominal suffix, the yod on the end. So it's my daughters. Lama, why? Te lakna is from halak. And uh, you have only two letters showing, and it's a pe wow. The tseri under the prefix tells you it's going to be an uh, initial wow verb. And so it's uh, that initial wow verbs, there's only six of them. So you memorize which ones, and halak is one of them that you must learn is pe wow or initial wow. And uh, halak is what is used here. Uh, why would you go? It's a cal imperfect, thir uh, second, excuse me, second feminine plural from halak, hey, lamed, kaf. Imi, 
with me. Im, prepos, uh, the im preposition plus the hierikiod of the first common singular pronominal suffix. Any questions on the first half of verse 11? All right. By the way, did you catch the hint? I give hints about final exams all of these last three weeks. What verb are you to remember? Halak. Okay, a word to the wise is sufficient. All right. If you look at the exam that you just had, number two, uh, excuse me, page one, halak was given for you as a pay wow or a one wow. There at the very first line on page one, don't expect it to be a gift next time. All right. If you take good notes and pay attention to what I emphasize and focus on, I give you plenty of clues about the final exam. You'll find that only 5% of the final exam might be something that I did not cover with you specifically prior to the exam. 95% will be covered by going over exams numbers 1 and 2, doing the last two translations, and also listening to what I give you in class when we go through the review. All right. Let's go to the second half of verse 11, and uh, we're down to uh, Tom. I don't feel you want like to read it aloud for us first? Um, right after the Athenac in verse 11. <laughs> Ode. Right after Imi in verse 11. Okay, Ha'od. Li. Banim. Bameyai. Bameyai. Where are you? La ha na la 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 Okay. And translation? I don't have it. All right. Campus. Shall I again have stones <coughs> in your womb that they be for you husbands? All right. Shall I again have sons for uh, have sons for me? Literally, Lee. Shall I again have sons uh, in my womb? So they might be husbands for you. Literally for you, for husbands. For men. Be for husbands. All right. Any questions there? Ha, od. That's the he interrogative. The he interrogative. Before od. Li is the Laman preposition with first common singular pronominal suffix. Banim is sons. Bamei I, the base preposition in. Mea is womb. The uh, yod suffix is a first common singular pronominal suffix, my. And then wehayu is a lamed he verb, third he. Haya, he was. Wow, conjunction. Hayu is a cal perfect third common plural. Notice that the second he has disappeared. That's what happens with the final he and final olive verbs. Often that letter disappears. Lakim, preposition lamed, plus the second masculine plural pronominal suffix. La enashim, enashim is the plural of enosh. Uh, it's also considered to be the plural of ish. Uh, the ish has only one time in the Old Testament that the plural occurs as ishim. It is primarily switched to en-nashim, 
when you have a plural of ish. And the Laman preposition with a pathic under it because the Aleph has a compound schwa. Therefore, the corresponding short vowel is placed under the Laman because you cannot have two uh, schwas together at the beginning of a word, even if one of them is compound. So it changes to the corresponding short vowel pathic. It does not indicate that there's an article there. Yes? Could you go over the translation of those last three words, please? Mm -hmm. That they should be husbands for you. That they should be husbands for you. Thank you. Okay. Greg? The first half of the, before the acronym? Yes. Uh, so, so Naomi said, return my daughters or turn back my daughters. Why should you go with me? Okay. Any other questions on verse 11? Yes, Scott. Uh, just with regard to Greg's question, kind of a follow-up there. The uh, first imperative, did you ever use the uh, second person you in no. there? No. It never occurred? No. We, we, don't, we don't use yes because it's imperative. Okay. And we don't use the you in English to okay. re express the imperative. Okay, thank you. All right. And by the way, because of that, and because the prefix is removed, and when you're parsing imperatives, never give the person. All imperatives are second person. So all I have to do is say masculine, singular, masculine, plural, feminine, singular, feminine, plural. You don't need to give person. Yes, Jan. Not even when you want to identify the person like you. <laughs> uh, if, if it needs to be identified that way, it is normally identified with a personal pronoun in the text of the Hebrew itself. Okay. Campus? Can you say but, Naomi replied in verse 11? I would avoid using but to translate Wayyik Tol. In only very rare occurrences is it legitimate because it normally shows a sequence. Okay. So then, so, thus or nothing at all, or therefore. All right, now let's see if I'm missing anyone. I have Kenny, I have Gus, John Strickland, Scott Jackson, Jeff, James, David, Eric, uh, John, Milcon, Kyle, Chad, Franz, Greg, James Wood, Roger, Dennis, Jan, George, Kempis, Tom, Kelly, we're missing you. So if you thought I was going to just skip over you, didn't you? Now, let's see, do we give you the whole of verse 12? No, we'll just give you the first line there, okay? Up to the Athnac. <laughs> uh, Shevna. Shovna. Shovna. Um, Bota. Benotai. Benotai. Leitna, Ki, Zak, Neti, Zakanti, Zakanti, Meho, Meheyo, Meheyo, Laish, Laish, right, okay. Translation My daughters return. Return to them uh, because I am old. Um, I'm old from old, for well, husbands to a husband um, from having. Is that from Haya? Yes. Okay, so. I'm old from having a husband. Okay, very close. Very <coughs> good. All right. Let's look at this. Shovna benotai. Turn back. Return my daughters. Lakna. Lakna is from halak. Notice the na ending. It's a feminine plural imperative. Cal imperative feminine plural from halak. From Halak. Go, literally. Ki, because, zakanti, I am old, literally. 
but by context here with the min comparative, I am too old to have a husband. Literally, I am old from being for a man. Okay, that's the literal translation. I am old from being. Cal, infinitive construct of Haya. I am old from being for a man. And with a Lamed following Haya, it has the I've becoming from becoming for a man. In other words, I am too old to get married. I am too old to be married. I am too old for a husband. For being for a husband. All right? I am too old to marry. Any questions here? Scott. Could that be for I am, go for I am too old to take a husband? You can translate that way, but take is nasa normally in the idioms, and haya instead is just talking about being married. I would prefer it to be, I am too old to be married to a man. Okay. To be married rather than to take a husband. To have a husband? To have a husband would be fine. I'd accept that, have or be. But not to take. The take is always reserved for the man normally taking a wife. But it's, it's not becoming too old. No, it's not becoming too old. It's a cal perfect. I am too old. Cal perfect, not Cal imperfect. The becoming has to do with becoming married. All right. All right. Anyone else? All right. Let's read on here for a minute. Ki amarti yeshli tikwa. Indeed, I say there is hope. For, or, or if I say, excuse me, not indeed. If I say. There is hope for me. Key, if, by context, you will find out. Amerti, Cal perfect, first common singular from Amer. Yesh, the positive of existence, there is. Li, Laman preposition, with first common singular pronominal suffix. Tikwa, the noun that means hope. If I say, there is hope for me. Gam, hayiti, halayala, even. Gam, Hayiti, I will have Halayala this night, Laish. I would have a husband tonight. I would be married tonight. It's taking the same phraseology as in the first half with Haya followed by a Lamed plus Ish to become married. Even if I were to become married tonight. Wagam yalad ti banim, and even bear sons. Yalad ti is a cal perfect first common singular. And obviously, she isn't finished yet with her statement, but that's where we're standing right now. If I say there is hope for me, even if I uh, am married tonight, I become married tonight, and even if I bear sons, bear children. But here are sons by context because she needs sons to marry Ruth and Orpah, if that's what they're thinking. She's giving her reasons. She's responding to their thinking. She, no, you can't stay with me. I'm, not gonna, I'm too old to get married again and have sons. And you're going to wait around for them? And then how much older than them are you going to be? It wasn't very acceptable in that culture for a woman to be that much older than her husband to begin with. So uh, she's showing them the ridiculousness of their situation and how it is absolutely necessary that they quit following her and they go elsewhere to find a husband. Any questions on the remainder of verse 12? All right, we're going to stop right there. And Oh, I have to do 13 first, real quick, because uh, we were going to go through 13 orally. You turned in 14 and following written, and you'll get those back, but I need to go over 13 for you. Helahin, a he interrogative on a Lamed preposition, plus the third feminine plural pronominal suffix, hain. Uh, will there be for you, then will there be for you, te 
sab sabayerna ad esher yigdalu helahain te agena labilti heyot laish al benotai ki merli meod mikem ki yats a b v yad yahweh okay here we have an interrogative a question for them literally uh, will there be for them tisaberna uh, will you literally will you uh, wait will you uh, be patient saver will you wait for them until they grow older literally until they grow big yigdalu cal imperfect third masculine plural Tis saberna is from saver and it is a uh, cal imperfect second feminine plural. Will you wait for them until then? Will you wait for them until they grow old, till they grow up? Helahin te agena labilti hayot laish. Here and uh, for, for them again. Or excuse me. Uh, yeah, we have for them. Notice here we have a feminine plural. Third, third feminine plural pronoun used in place of the sons. Remember we had the masculine plural used for the daughters-in-law earlier in verses eight and nine, and now down here we're having the feminine plural. Uh, if you pull out, I don't have mine with me, but if you pull out your uh, diagram that I gave you of Ruth chapter 1 if you have that available and take a look at that there should be a note there for you that's it right here okay this is the diagram I handed out to you I think I handed out to you the same time I handed out that other sheet as well and if you look at it on uh, the third page where you look at verse 13 Notice there you have a protosis, you have the apotosis, you have the uh, subordinate clauses. Okay? So you can see that this continues on the conditional sentence. Then. Then will you wait for them until they are grown? And we know that the they is they because uh, of the two boys because yigdalu is masculine plural. And uh, will you uh, avoid marriage literally again or excuse me uh, this is uh, aga al, uh, ayin gimel hey will you avoid will you forego will you remain unmarried unmarried because labilti is the negative the negative is used labilti is used as negative with infinitives heyot is the infinitive construct Cal infinitive construct of haya, so it's not being laish for a man, meaning the idiom again, not being married. Will you forego marriage for them? Al binotai, no, my daughters. No. No, my daughters. Because or indeed, mar li me od, it is exceedingly bitter for me mikem than for you notice now she switched to the masculine plural to refer to them third feminine plural to refer to her sons hypothetical sons second masculine plural to refer to them ki yats a vi yad yahweh because the hand of yahweh has gone out against me. Yatsa'a is a cal perfect third feminine singular from yatsa. B is the baith preposition and a first common singular pronominal suffix and here it has the idea of against. The hand of Yahweh has gone out against me. Okay? Indeed it is more bitter for me than for you. Because the hand of Yahweh has gone out against me. All right, let me go over verse 13 again. And it's implied here that we're in the apotesis. Then, then would you 
wait for them until they are grown up? And would you abstain from marrying for them? No, my daughters. Indeed, it is more bitter. It is exceedingly more. It is very much more. It is much more. I'm trying to say better. It is much more bitter for me than for you. Because the hand of Yahweh has gone out against me. First thing, I want to deal with the diagramming. Uh, I put off the diagramming assignment for one more class time because I wanted to remind you of a couple of things. Uh, on your diagram, I want you to make certain that you label it clearly. Label what your text is. You have Deuteronomy 5, 6 through 13. Uh, I want you to put your name on it and your box number. I don't have a box number, so my box number isn't up here on this. Uh, make certain that as you do the diagram that you have the uh, uh, verse numbers at the beginning of each verse on the right hand side. As here you see verse 4 and you see verse 5. And uh, this ignore the color coding here. You don't have time to do color coding. I'm looking at very basic diagramming. I'm not looking at detailed diagramming. I'm looking to see that you see grouped concepts. You see related concepts. I'm looking for this as your first time of doing diagramming for grading. I'm not looking for perfection. If you turn in a diagram and it's even close to being acceptable, you're going to get an A on it. <laughs> All right. You have a written translation due the same day as Jeff reminded you. And so I'm, I'm hoping that you didn't wait uh, until the last minute to start on your diagramming and that uh, you were, had already begun thinking that it might be due even today. And when you got my email, you took a sigh of relief and said, okay, I can get something else done that I need to get done. And you can set that aside for a while. But I just want you to plow down through that text and remember primarily these things. Never, ever, ever change the order of the Hebrew. Don't change the order of the Hebrew. Number one. Number two, divide it by major disjunctive accents like Zakef Katon, like uh, the Athnak, and sometimes the Revia. Uh, and if you divide it down that far and show its logical relationships, you'll do all right. It will not be a huge problem. I want, it, I want something that I can work with with you and give you comments back on and help direct you to better practices. But you have to give me something to work with. All right? Rather than just a blank page or rather than just copying the text. I want you to attempt to arrange it diagrammatically. We went over it. Remember when Dr. Grisanti's class was in here? We spent... Uh, a total of two hours practically on going over diagramming and showing you how to do it, how to use your computer to do it, how to use a table to do it. Uh, I'm not looking for anything over here on this side. That was something else there. But just looking for a very clean type of diagramming going on. All right? And you may turn it in either hard copy, printed, or you may turn it in electronically. If you turned in electronically, uh, if I open it and find out that I don't have the Hebrew font you're using, I'll send word back to you by email and ask you to create a PDF file. And you can create a PDF file. There is a, uh, if you don't have Adobe to where you can do a uh, PDF printing, uh, there's something called Qt PDF. You go online to www.cutepdf.com. And there's a free program to download that will do, that will behave as your PDF printer. Um, I got this uh, recommendation from the IT department. They recommend it and said it's trustworthy. And so I put it on my wife's computer. She's been using it for a long time and loves it. And so it's free. It's a free download. There's no reason not to have a good PDF printer on your computer. So that's where you go to get the download. If you're, how many, is anyone in here working on a Mac, Macintosh? Okay, Gus, several of you. Okay, if you're working on Macintosh, you have to provide with a PDF file. 
but because you're on a Macintosh, you already have a PDF printer included in your software. It's just like the advertisements on television. Have you seen them? Where Mac and PC meet each other and Mac is always standing there nice and cool and collected and, and relaxed and PC is always trying to do him one better and uh, Mac always says, I already have that, that's included. Well, this is one of the things you guys have that's included. You don't have to worry about it, okay? I have a Mac at home, but I don't do my grading on it, and I don't have the same Hebrew fonts you might have, because the Hebrew fonts I have on my Mac are in order to do my uh, linguistic and exegetical key for Kregel. And so I'm using their uh, approved Hebrew fonts, and I doubt if any of you have that. They're expensive fonts, and they provide them for me, so I use that. So if you have a Mac, do a PDF file for me, okay? All right, that takes care of that then. The next thing I want to cover is the uh, area of lexicons, lexicons, because we're moving along. Last week we talked about uh, concordances. This week, today, we're going to talk about lexicons briefly, and we're going to move on then. We'll, we may have to finish that up on Thursday. We'll see how far we get. And then on, on uh, Thursday, we're also going to take a look at theological dictionaries. I'll bring them in, and we'll look at them and how to use them. What you see on the screen is Brown, Driver, and Briggs. And by the way, when you abbreviate references, BDB is not to be italicized because BDB represents the author's names. It's an acronym for the authors, Brown, Driver, and Briggs. We never italicize author's names in a footnote or bibliography reference, so you do not italicize BDB. You do italicize abbreviations that represent the acronym for the title, because titles are italicized. So HALOT should be italicized. DCH, for Dictionary of Classical Hebrew, should be italicized. If you want to refer to HALOT, uh, you could use KB, Kohler Baumgartner, the two chief editors, and it's KB3 is the current HALOT. Uh, I have up here KB2, uh, and there was a KB1 before that, first, second, and third editions. But uh, be certain of that. Normally, we just refer to Jastrow's lexicon as Jastro, and Holiday as Holiday. And uh, if you're going to abbreviate or use shortened forms in any way. Uh, the handout you received earlier that uh, you had there shows you what the old... Uh, Kohler and Baumgartner looked like before it was translated into English. You can see the, he the uh, German on the left side. You can see my translation on the right side. Uh, this is something I did while I was in my doctoral program at Grace Theological Seminary because uh, I was doing a paper for one of my professors. And uh, as I was doing this paper, I prepared this sheet so I could use it in teaching to show how to use and what the material was within uh, the Kohler and Baumgartner lexicon. And so it expands it, interprets it, and uh, translates it into English, which is what then Halot is now what has been done by M.E.J. Richardson uh, as a translator in the current edition. So uh, that just gives you an idea of what it looks like. But as you look at, at uh, Brown, Driver, and Briggs, notice you have here, and we're going to use Mashach, uh, notice you have references here. This is in the enhanced new Brown, Driver, and Briggs. And so you have references to TWOT, which is Theological Word Book of the Old Testament. Notice that they have failed here to properly italicize the abbreviation, although they've italicized in the uh, pop-up the title. And so TWOT should also be in italics. Uh, and the S here is for Strong's Concordance, and Strong is the... Uh, compiler, so it's not italicized. GK is for uh, Goodrick Kohlenberger, uh, their concordance, and so that is uh, why it's not uh, put in there. And by the way, I see there's a uh, typo there. On, they have con uh, condordance there. have to send them, a, send Lagos a, a note about that. But uh, as you're looking across here, you can see the main uh, meaning in uh, the bold. And then it's talking about being from the Neo-Hebrew, the New Hebrew, and the origin probably as the Arabic, and giving you the Arabic, wipe or stroke with a hand. And then uh, references here from uh, Robertson Smith, religion of the Semites, RS should actually be in italics since it's for religion of the Semites, not for Rob Robertson Smith. And then anoint, Aramaic, Mashak, and here in the Aramaic they're actually using Syriac, 
It's not really Aramaic, it's Syriac, the font here. So this is one of the reasons we don't use BDB is because of the fact that they're using very old terminology and not up to date with how things are referred to. This Meshach is Aramaic, this one is Syriac. And in Aramaic inscriptions and the Palmyran and the Ethiopic, and here you have the Ethiopic word actually, Mashach, and means to anoint, to feast, to dine. It goes on down through the Assyrian, the Aramaic, the Arabic, where it can also mean measure. And then goes into the Cal, the perfect, third masculine singular. And this represents Mashach, the same as what's given here. If you ever have something with a, uh, a word or a letter and then this uh, apostrophe, it just, that's an abbreviation because you already know what it is because it's given up here. And so it just represents the same thing, Mashach. Uh, two times, and then with a suffix, Mishachka, in Psalm 45, 8, etc. It goes all the way down. You have all the information given for you here in Brown, Driver, and Briggs. And um, notice here that when it recites number 615, that it tells you P for priestly, priest code or narrative. This is another reason we don't like to use Brown, Driver, and Briggs. They are documentarians. They believe in the documentary hypothesis. They do not accept the Pentateuch as being written by one author, Moses. In fact, they accept it as being written by a multiplicity of authors and edited by a multiplicity of editors everywhere from the 9th century BC, 500 years after Moses, down to 620, or actually down to 512 BC. 512 BC. So they have a... Uh, predisposition toward a very hyper, uh, higher critical viewpoint of the Pentateuch and uh, it, it affects their interpretation, it affects their translations, it affects their decisions. And so it's another reason why we don't like to use Brown, Driver and Briggs. Then underneath it you have Mishcha and this is the noun, ointment. Now in the other lexicons, Mishcha is listed separately. But in Brown, Driver, and Briggs, you have to look up things under the roots. You have to know the root and then look them up under the roots. And so it moves that way. Now, let's take that off the screen. And let's go to Kohler and Baumgartner, Halot. And you'll notice that they have the Ugaritic, the Ugaritic, Mashach, Gordon's textbook, Driver, Myth, Seisleitner, Middle Hebrew, Old Aramaic, uh, Egyptian Aramaic, the Palmyran, the Jewish Aramaic, the Samaritan, Samaritan is not given very often in Brown, Driver, and Briggs. The Syriac, instead of calling it Aramaic, they have it correctly identified as, as Syriac. The Arabic, the Mandaean, the Ethiopic, and uh, the Amorite. The Amorite evidence is cataloged, which Brown, Driver, and Briggs did not catalog. Uh, you have to keep in mind that Brown, Driver, and Briggs was written and done before the Ugaritic finds. Therefore, they have nothing about the Ugaritic. Found before the Dead Sea Scroll finds. Therefore, nothing about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Found prior to all of the uh, uh, context of material that has been produced on Amorite, including Ammonite and uh, Moabite and other ancient Canaanite materials. They did not have access to those. Many of those materials had not yet been discovered or published when Brown, Driver, and Briggs did their work. So if you use Brown, Driver, and Briggs, you're using a lexicon that is over 110 years old and lacks all of the information that has been found in the last century. And uh, that puts you at a distinct disadvantage and it puts them at a disadvantage and causes them to make decisions that are, in, that are absolutely inaccurate. So that's why we don't use Brown, Driver, and Briggs. You go through and it has the cow and goes through all the way to the uh, uh, nifal. When you have a dagger at the end of a uh, entry, that means just as the pop-up says here, every biblical reference is cited within the entry. So there are no other uses of the cow other than what are cited within this article. And then also the nifal. All uses of the nifal are listed here. This one, two, three, four, five uses. And then it gives you the derivatives. And then if you want to go to the noun mishcha, you have to look it up under a separate heading. It is listed separately. It's not listed underneath 
that. So if it has a different, for example, if you want to look up Makom, you don't look under Kum. Uh, Makom for place. Go back here. Makom is listed under the name, not under Kum. But if you look it up in BDB, you have to look it up under Kum, the root. And that's the advantage of the newer lexicons, is that it puts the, even the nouns derived from the roots are listed separately so that you can find them. So that if you don't know the root and you're looking for them in BDB, you can't find them. Now the enhanced versions of BDB have gone through and attempted to put in most of those nouns alphabetically, like makom in the memes, and a reference to C, kum. But they haven't done it for all of them, and some of them are missed, and some of them are misidentified. So uh, watch out for that. Uh, then let's uh, go to the overhead projector for the next part here. If we look at mashach, Here, you can see that in uh, Kohler and Baumgartner 2, if you were to read down through this, you would find, number one, that you have the German, mit dem Hand hinstreichen über, stroke with a hand. And then as you go down through, you've got the uh, German given and a translation. And this was done before the third edition. Uh, the first edition had the translation as well, but it helps you to see what the German was. And there were a lot of mistakes in this edition and they had to publish a, uh, a separate section that was hardback because it was so much <laughs> that they had to add all the addenda to it to uh, uh, supplement this edition at a later date. And it is not as complete. It is a shortened form. This KB uh, two is very close to what we have in holiday because this is an abbreviated form of Kohler and Baumgartner from the German and that's what holiday has done but holiday improved upon KB2 because he did a more accurate translation of the German there are many errors here in translating the German and he made better choices in order to get a manual lexicon that students could carry around with them and not be weighed down by something as heavy as this and with as many errors as this. And so he has some different decisions that he makes. Then I don't have the main volume of the, class, the Dictionary of Classical uh, uh, Hebrew by David Klein, but I thought I'd at least show you what it looks like here. As you look at the entry here, uh, lehava, flame, or point. Uh, you've got the construct form given, the plural. You have flame, it's given as a substantive. You go down through and it gives all the different ways in which it is used and the phrases in which it is used as idioms and gives you references in other materials in the Qumran scrolls, for example. Uh, you have the Qumran scrolls all cataloged within Klein's classical dictionary of classical Hebrew. Uh, that is not done in Halot. Halot does not catalog all of the Dead Sea Scrolls references the way that Klein does. And so if you want to get a full picture of the Hebrew, classical Hebrew, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, you want to look at Klein. He has a lot of good material. This is a multi-volume work. It will never be a manual volume. Uh, it is a huge amount of work. Like here on coal, every, he lists all the occurrences, uh, the different types of use of coal with shakav, with shamer, with amer, with yashav. He goes through and, and goes verb by verb to catalog. No other dictionary has as detailed a cataloging of words as Klein's. Therefore, if you're doing a specialized word study, you don't want to ignore the Dictionary of Classical Hebrew by Kleins. You want to make certain that you look at it. And uh, that is uh, now, I think, up to, this is 1998 for the fourth volume. 
And uh, I think that uh, we're up now to, I think, the sixth volume, sixth or seventh volume, and it's still going. The other is a two-volume work that I think now is available in one that is by Marcus Jastro. And just to zoom in here further, because he has very small print. Okay, there's Mashach. And he, talk, he listed here as Biblical Hebrew, B-H, gives to stroke, to smear, especially to anoint, to install an office by anointing, and then he does something that none of the other lexicons do. He lists all of the Middle Hebrew usages and Aramaic usages found in rabbinic writings. And he gives you the references to those rabbinic writings in the Talmud and the Mishnah, and he gives translations, and he sometimes gives even interpretations. And so he is very interesting in the fact that he's bringing the body of Jewish literature to bear on the meaning of terms used in Biblical Hebrew to show you how they're used in later rabbinic issues and rabbinic places. And sometimes it's revealing to see how the Jews are interpreting some of the Old Testament passages that you may be looking at. So the Jewish element for Jastro, the Dead Sea Scroll elements and detailed lexical and semantic analysis inclines. The most recent scholarship for Biblical Hebrew and Semitic languages in Halot. And BDB, outdated, outmoded, uh, error-ridden, very liberal in theology. You'll use it from time to time, you'll look at it, you'll refer to it, but take a warning. Be very, very cautious in depending on it. If you have only BDB as a Hebrew lexicon, you do not have a good Hebrew lexicon. All right? Yes? Uh, after calling it, what would you say would be the next one we should, we should purchase? I think that you should try to get the uh, two volume. In fact, I think they're going to try to put it in one now. Uh, the manual edition of Halot would be the next best thing for you to have. Though the only people who are going to buy Kleins are those who are going to go into teaching Hebrew and uh, the, maybe the seminary or whoever they're working is going to give them a book allowance where they can uh, pay for it out of a book allowance because it's way too expensive for pastors to get hold of and, and, and have. Jastro is more uh, the speed of what most of us can afford. <laughs> All right.